Hey, everybody, this is Ben Bowman. Welcome back to another episode of The Oregon Bridge. Truman was right in the moment saying, we can look out for the taxpayers' money. We won't criticize military strategy, but we can look at these contracts and see whether you're spending the money right. 32 reports, thousands of pages, every single one of them bipartisan and unanimous. It's one of the things that Truman himself, decades later, was most proud about. By super focusing on the facts and not opinion, there was no opinions expressed. It was basically, this is the facts. And Truman did this 32 times. It's really an amazing story. All right, folks, uh, welcome back to another week of the Oregon Bridge. Uh, so for those of you who I know personally, I have been talking about and thinking about uh, government oversight for a few months now. And uh, I came across this book because um, the author was on a friend of mine's podcast. And the book is called The Watchdog, How the Truman Committee Battled Corruption and Helped Win World War II. Our YouTube listeners can see the book right now. And uh, I love this book so much. <laughs> it was so much fun to read. And it was one of those books, as I mentioned in the beginning of the interview, that like sometimes you're at this moment in your life where you're thinking about a thing or you're navigating a thing and like the perfect book comes in that is just like very inspiring and helps you think about things differently. And that's what that book, this book was for me as I've been thinking about government oversight. Um, I told Steve, uh, Steve Drummond, uh, who is our, our guest today, that uh, I told him after the podcast that I was like, I've got, just got so many ideas and ways of thinking about it. And um, it is a brilliant case study of one of the most notable um, incidents of government oversight in the history of our country, the Truman Committee. Um, so basically, during the defense buildup to World War II and then the war production effort to World War II, the United States Senate had a special committee that was investigating um waste, fraud, and abuse that was going on during uh, the war buildup. And as I mentioned um, on the episode, I think a lot of people, when they think of the term government oversight, they like start to fall asleep a little bit. It sounds boring, uh, or maybe it sounds like overly political, like oversight, oh, a tool to like a, a political tool to go after your enemies or to undermine a program that you don't support, which unfortunately is, I think, how oversight is often used in contemporary politics. This is a story that is not like that at all. Um, it is a book about saving people's lives. It is a book about saving billions of dollars. It is about the uh, the United States winning World War II and some of the miracles that had to happen for that to occur. And ultimately, it's about how a junior senator from Missouri who did not have a great reputation or much stature before this committee existed became the vice president of the United States and then very rapidly after that, the president of the United States. Um, and we all know the rest of the Harry Truman story. He um, leads us through the conclusion of World War II, makes the decision to drop two uh, atomic bombs in Japan. Uh, I just saw the movie Oppenheimer. Some of you probably have too. It's an incredible movie, by the way. Um, so a lot of us know who Harry Truman is and know a little bit about his place in American history. But this book is not at all about the, the presidency. It's not at all about um, Truman as president. It is about him as a young senator uh, who starts this committee uh, and conducts brilliant oversight that is bipartisan, not nonpartisan, as we talk about, um, that is done with integrity, but also, uh, you know, sometimes cuts some corners to avoid controversy, keeps some things out of the public, you know, takes some bat battles super public and goes after people. Um, it's a great book. It's a great case study. And, you know, we don't explicitly talk about um, Oregon in this book. Um, but what we do talk about is the case study uh, or the Truman Committee as a case study for conducting government oversight and lessons that can be learned at the state level, at the local level, at the national level, um, when folks are thinking about like how can the government do a better job of making sure money is spent wisely, programs are being implemented properly, um, and that you know ultimately taxpayers are getting their do their their dollars worth. Uh, and we're succeeding in the aims that we're uh, pursuing. It's a great book. It was an awesome uh, opportunity for me to meet Steve. Um, I've been carrying this book around for a while as I've been reading it. And um, as I told him, I had more notes going into this interview than I have in a very long time. Um, so we cover a lot of ground and I hope you'll find it as interesting um, to listen to as I had, uh, or as interesting as it was for me to 
to do the interview with Steve. Uh, so with that, I will stop talking and we will jump into the interview with Steve Drummond. Uh, I don't think I mentioned he's an NPR journalist. He's a senior editor and executive producer at NPR. He also teaches journalism at the University of Maryland. He's been with um, the station for many, many years, You know, overseeing a lot of different uh, projects and employees. And um, he's kind of a big deal at NPR. And this is his first book. Um, so without further ado, uh, please enjoy this week's interview with Steve Drummond. Now that the legislative session is over, it's time for Oregon's activists, candidates, and political committees to turn their attention to the 2024 elections. With government regulation of political activities becoming more complicated nearly every year, and with political actors increasingly initiating complaints and litigation to achieve political goals, Having experienced legal counsel has become critical to success in the political arena. Harang Long PC has represented clients involved in candidate and ballot measure elections for decades. To learn more about Harang Long's political law practice, check out our website at harang.com. That's www.harrang.com. Steve Drummond, uh, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Ben. Thanks for having me. Uh, absolutely. This is, uh, you know, there's some books that we come across in our lives that are like the perfect book for the moment that you're in right now. And your book is that for me right now. I've been obsessed with oh, it. Thank and you. Every meeting I've had in the last like month, I've brought this book up. Um, so I'm really <laughs> grateful that you took the time to to chat with me today. Um, so my audience is, is mostly Oregon politicos, and your book appropriately starts in the city of Portland. Can you explain to listeners what happened on January 16th, 1943 in Portland, and why is that relevant to Harry Truman? Sure. It's kind of this mystery story that's one of the sort of key things that got me into deciding to write this book several years ago. January. So let me back up a little bit. Uh, 1943, the United States is at war now, has been at war for a, uh, a more than a year since mm -hmm. Pearl Harbor. Um, one of the big challenges for the Allies in World War II is merchant ships. Basically, mm -hmm. Britain at this point stood alone, along with the Soviet Union, against Hitler, uh, the German army, uh, had taken over most of Europe. Great Britain was surviving basically on ships that were bringing fuel and food and cargo to Great Britain from the United States. Well, waiting in the Atlantic Ocean to put a stop to that, to sink those ships were German U-boats, the submarines. Mm -hmm. At this point in the war, this is a bad situation because the Germans were sinking more merchant ships than the, than the United States could build. Shipbuilders all over the country were racing to solve this problem. One of the most successful was a guy named Henry Kaiser. Mm -hmm. He had transformed what once was the uh, Portland Municipal Airport on Swan Island into mm -hmm. a shipyard, which is still there, the Swan Island Shipyard. The very first ship built in that shipyard was a fuel tanker called the SS Schenectady. On January 16th of that year, the Schenectady was sitting there in calm waters, getting ready for her very first voyage. The ship had mm -hmm. never been out to sea before. Uh, there were about 30 men on board, loading it up, getting it ready for its first voyage. At 10.35 p.m., there was a loud, booming sound, a crack, a, a sound like an explosion. The ground shook. People heard it more than a mile away. Firefighters and police getting a call that there, that a bomb had gone off or something. A ship had exploded, raced to the scene. So did the FBI. Um, really weird. Um, they, Is it, yeah. The, Is it a... Is it an attack from the enemies? Like, are someone yeah. here? Like, what's going on? We don't know. Exactly. There's a picture in the book. It looked like the ship was 543 feet long. It looked like a giant had picked it up and gone and snapped yeah. it in two and then set it back down. So by the next day, the FBI was looking at it. The head of the shipyard was like, it's not an explosion or the metal parts would have blown outward. It just cracked. So... Everybody's, you know, it was a giant security crackdown. Many, many investigations began. But for several months, nobody quite knows what happened to this ship. And what happened to this ship ends up being a big part of the story of the mm -hmm. Truman Committee and a big part of the story of how Harry Truman became vice president and ultimately president of the United States. 
Perfect introduction. So, so before we start talking about oversight and the Truman Committee yeah, yeah. and yep. their charge, um, yep. most of my listeners. So this is an appropriate time to have this conversation. I just saw the movie yep. Oppenheimer on Monday. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so Harry Truman, I think in uh, modern American uh, understanding, is he's a wartime president who drops the bombs. That's his big right. his big uh, footnote in history. Is like he makes the decision. Um, but before he gets to the presidency, he is a junior senator from the state of Missouri. And the way he's described in this book, I, I, can you to tell the listener who is yep. Harry Truman before yep. the presidency? He's and before the Truman Committee starts, I should say. Like, yep. what's his reputation? It, what's he like? It's one of the things that makes it again a fun story. Harry Truman in nineteen January nineteen forty one was basically a nobody in mm -hmm. Washington, almost less than that. He had served a single term in the Senate in which he had basically sat there and done virtually nothing. <laughs> right. But not only that, most of his fellow senators and most of the press and everything kind of view him not just as a nobody, but as a negative force. He was mm -hmm. widely viewed as had been placed in the Senate by the Kansas City political boss, a guy named Tom Pendergast. Pendergast Truman right. was kind of known, if anybody knew who Truman was, they basically knew him as the senator from Pendergast, right. he was called. So Franklin Roosevelt had met with Truman a grand total in six years of four times, I think. Um, <laughs> so in other words, Truman was on nobody's political radar at this time. He was a junior senator. The, the, uh, the other senator, a guy named Champ Bennett Clark, way more better known at the time, was considered the political power in Missouri. So Truman basically is an invisible person in Washington. I mean, given the fact that he was a United States senator. And that's how my story begins, basically. Yeah, so he he has no like strong reputation. Uh, I, I I like the the description you used for the members of the committee. You said a senatorial B list whose distinguishing <laughs> characteristic was a sort of unspectacular competence. So it's not like they thought he yeah. was dumb uh, or unqualified, nope. but he's just like he's just a guy. He's a backbencher essentially. Yep. Um, yep. But Truman gets really excited and animated by this idea of oversight of the defense program buildup. What was his yep. case for the committee and why was he so excited about this idea? Yeah. So soon after he he, he narrowly won re-election in November of 1940 in an election that most people, including the president of the United States, has had supported his opponent. Truman <laughs> scraped by. He won his second term. In the few weeks after that, Truman returned to Washington. He was kind of, you know, recovering from the campaign. He was getting letters from some of his constituents. Mm -hmm. Um this, of course, is before Pearl Harbor. The United States is not at war yet, but was trying what Franklin Roosevelt knew. The war was coming and the United States was racing as fast as it ever could. Once again, it's pretty much a story of our history. The United States racing once again to um, to get ready for war. One of the things that was needed was uh, army camps. The army at this time, the U.S. Army was ranked 17th in the world in 1939 when the war broke out behind Romania in size. Wow. So here we are, 20 years after fighting a big war, you know, the, the defense cuts and everything. So uh, one of the big things that was needed was army camps. We were going to need camps all over the country to train, equip, feed, house, you know, eventually a million and eventually 13 million people. So Truman starts getting these letters from his constituents. Hey, they're building an army camp out here in the Ozarks. It was called Fort Leonard Wood. Mm -hmm. Something funny is going on. Letter and letter and letter saying, hey, Nobody's working, uh, you know, guys, uh, contractors are getting rich, all kinds of stuff's going on here. One of the great things about Truman is he doesn't send a staffer out to investigate. He doesn't get on a plane with a senatorial, con uh, uh, you know, delegation like we have today. Truman walks out of his apartment one day in January 1941. He gets in his car <laughs> and he drives out to Missouri and no fanfare, no nothing. Here's a, here's a short guy in a suit walking around asking questions. And he sees all this stuff. Lumber sitting out in the snow going to ruin, guys sitting around playing cards, contractors mm -hmm. making several times the profits they should be making. And Truman kept going. He, he checked out several other uh, con construction sites and he saw the same thing. So Truman came back to Congress in February 1941, very angry. And he's... It's the the way I re recall from the book. It's not like this is a this is a, a mainstream idea that people are getting behind. I think yep. the majority leader wasn't particularly excited about this, but but Truman is sort of insistent nope. that we should do this. 
Exactly. Truman got up on the Senate floor on February 10th and he said, hey, this is this. There's some funny business going on here. We should start to look into this. The government's letting a lot of contracts. He pointed out, as many people knew, after after World War One, there were 117 separate investigations of the war effort. One of them, believe it or not, ran all the way into the 1930s. Hmm. Truman's point was, what, what's the point of that? It's all the money's gone. The, you know, the, it's the, too late. The war is over. It's too late. So Truman's idea, which was kind of, he was saying, let's look into this now while we're spending this money, while we maybe can save some of the taxpayers money. As you point out, Ben, nobody in, Truman was a Democrat in a Democratic administration with a Democratic president. Nobody was really crazy about this idea. Well, and, but, and, and, and yeah, and, go ahead. Well, and you could be perceived, well, this is what I kept thinking. It's a dangerous line for being perceived anti-war or anti-America. Like right. the, w- the way oversight is used in this country today is oftentimes to undermine uh, whatever yep. program you're overseeing. That's not what Truman was saying here. No, but be- of course, as you can imagine, time and time again during World War II, Truman was accused of just that. Oftentimes, well, I'm getting ahead of the story, but anyway, he, yeah. um, he gets up on the floor, he makes his speech. Eventually, the Democrats realized, the president and the Democratic leadership realized, if the, if the Democrat didn't do such an investigation, oh, the Republicans are ready to go. <laughs> they were going to do it, too. So right. Truman's idea, originally, they would say no. Eventually, they come around to the idea. They toss him a bone, 15,000 bucks, basically barely enough to hire a lawyer and a couple of secretaries. <laughs> right. And they say, yeah, sure, here's your committee. They try to stock the committee with a bunch of Roosevelt loyalists to keep an eye on Truman. Truman kind of is pushing back to try and get, you know, a, a decent, as I, as we said, a B list of respectable senators. And so off he goes. That's basically how all this begins. And he, he's got the he's very creative about this. He like goes to the cabinet secretaries and is basically like, you're going to pay yep. my investigators. And so he builds up yep. like a, a relatively powerful committee but before we move forward we're going to skip ahead a little bit in the story just because i think it's uh it illustrates the point what was the case against the committee uh what comes to mind is uh general somerville who says he says you can't save time and money at the same time uh and this distracts us from winning the war etc so what was what were the naysayers saying about why this wasn't a necessary thing it's funny how many of these same circumstances exist today Yep. The, pen, the military and the defense contractors were saying several things. Oftentimes when Truman went into a factory or a, a defense plant, oh, you don't know anything about how to make airplanes. We, you know, you don't understand. You don't understand how hard it is. That was one. Two, always. Yeah, we're too busy. There's a war on. We don't have we don't have all this time to be answering your questions. And, you know, the, the chief of staff of the Navy or the Army would say the secretary of the Navy. I don't have time to be up on Capitol Hill answering these questions. uh, We got to fight a war. You're hindering the war effort. Time and time again, the Truman Mm -hmm. Committee heard this complaint. And then finally, same issue exists today. Oh, it's national security. You can't can't ask Mm -hmm. about that. That's top secret. No, no, hands off. Um, It's it's so funny. Every time we see today the $80 wrench or the $100 toilet seat in the (laughs) Pentagon budget, these same exist 70, 80 years later. They still exist. They're still around today. And so Truman was right in the moment saying his argument, of course, was, nope, but we can look out for the taxpayers' money. We can make sure we won't. He, he said time and again, we won't criticize military strategy. We yep. won't tell you how to fight the war, but we can look at these contracts and see whether you're spending the money right. Well, and that's what, something that I think it, he was clearly such a talented politician because he was very delicate about how no, oh, he, yeah. he, there were things he knew that he did not go public with. There were reports that he, where he exposed failures or, yep. and he, he thought that would undermine the war effort. So he held it back. There were yep. times where he did put people on blast in public hearings. Like he knew yep. how to massage his relationship with the president and the administration without going too far. He kind of stumbles one time and maybe goes a little too far, but gets lucky and it doesn't end up in yep. the press. Like he was a very nimble guy who clearly was yep. astute to the political dynamics that he was navigating. Oh, very much so. And for me, part of the fun of the story and of writing the book is watching Truman grow into this job. Nothing mm-hmm. had prepared him for national leadership before he became vice president, but these three years in which he had run this committee. And he started off, nobody was paying attention to the committee. You know, Truman was chugging along. They put out a couple of reports that suddenly people are like, whoa, this Truman guy, uh, you know, 
front page of every headline, $100 million wasted on army camps. That's that what that was their first big uh -huh. report, got national attention. All of a sudden, generals in the Pentagon are like, uh oh, you know, people are paying attention to this guy. And over three years, what you just described is is watching Harry Truman learn how to be a leader, learn when to hold back, when to strike out. Uh, oftentimes, one of his key things was Truman learned if he was willing not to take the credit for something, he yeah. could get a lot done. He his one of their early reports, he quietly gave it to Franklin Roosevelt three days ahead of time. So Roosevelt could take all the credit, look like the big shot. Truman writes in his memoirs. I don't care who got the credit. We just needed to get this problem solved. Oftentimes, if he just called up the army or the military, he could say, hey, you got a problem here. And if they fixed it, no harm, no foul. Truman was fine with that. It was only when he got stonewalled when they wouldn't give him the information he wanted. He'd say, OK, here comes a subpoena. Let's have a public hearing and let's invite all the press. Here's I wrote down your quote this is on page 112. Oh, yeah. Truman was walking a tightrope between the public interest and protecting his party in the administration, and his deft handling of this issue allowed Roosevelt to get the credit. And then Truman later says, that was all right with me. I wanted action more than credit. The irony here being this man who doesn't really care who gets the credit ends up on the front page of Time magazine. Yeah. He's a national name. Um, and yeah. so he didn't pursue it. I don't think he, you know... So, so okay actually before we we dive in too deep here um yeah, I, yeah. I will have i will have mentioned in the intro like i am really interested in this because the i think the topic of oversight government oversight is very interesting yep. and relevant today particularly at the state level yep. where i find myself um and so there's some like key ideas one of which is the politics of oversight that's my next question sure. but before we get there part of this is about media and press um yep. how I've got some notes here, but I'm curious how you think about how did Truman think about the press in yep. his role as chair of the Truman Committee? Like, were they an obstacle? Was he sending out press releases all the time? Was he dropping things to journalists? You know, what, what was his yep. approach? It's it's important to remember here, Truman uh, Truman was a politician, and that's, uh -huh. you know, the ground bait. There was a lot of effort to say, oh, the Truman Committee set aside politics or whatever. That's nonsense. You know, Truman was a politician working in a political environment, the U.S. Senate. Yeah. And part of that environment is the media. It is it is funny. I've now read many of the hundreds of letters that Truman wrote to his wife and to his daughter during the war. It's amazing how many times he mentions the fact that he doesn't care at all about the press or what they say about him. <laughs> right. And the exact next paragraph talks about that he was on the front <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's a little disingenuous. But Truman had a very good policy with the press. He didn't play favorites. He didn't leak stuff. He made sure that all the press got the same thing at the same time. And most importantly, and what really made him great with the press, he got the facts straight. This mm -hmm. wasn't a committee that put out reports of opinions. Um, it was a bipartisan committee. He really, really focused on the facts and those were given to the press, take it or leave it. And often those facts are very critical of the government or Franklin Roosevelt, even, they might be critical of a defense contractor. Basically, the reporters, the media learned that if they got a report from the Truman Committee, they weren't being spun. Mm -hmm. It wasn't uh, trying to uh, promote Truman's career or make him, you know, get him ready for the next stop. He was really working in the public service. And so I say in the book somewhere, by not seeking press, Truman ended up getting a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And then just a fact, part of why we're enjoying this conversation is Truman was a fun guy. He was funny. Yep. He was charming. He, he wasn't a blustering speech maker. Over and over and over again, reporters during the war saw they actually liked him. They felt mm -hmm. like he was a personable guy. He spoke straight to them. Uh, he often spoke in such foul language that they couldn't print what he said, but, uh, <laughs> but it made him very likable. And the Truman Committee became very popular with the press. So ben, are these answers too long? And I can't... no 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 these are perfect. This okay. is perfect. That's why I love the audio format. We can go okay. as long as we want on answers. Um, so I've been right. thinking, uh, like you know, I mentioned like obviously this happened, you know, many generations ago when Truman was doing this. But as a case study, it's super interesting yeah. because so this is a quote from Truman that you write about in the book that I kept, when I read it, I was like, this is this is one massive fundamental difference between how Truman conducted yep. oversight versus how oversight is done today by like the, you know, congressional committees. Yep. Truman says, well, we're going to have a lot of national press attention and we want to be careful that this doesn't become the kind of committee that's looking for headlines. 
So it seems to me like the, the press was coming to him because, you know, he, he sees this, this this opportunity, this window before World War II, uh, well, before the United States is fully engaged in World War II. Obviously, the more engaged right. we get in the war, the more that his work is the center of right. the universe of every. But he is not someone right. who's like thinking about headlines when he's conducting oversight or doing hearings or doing visits. He's not sending out these like flowery press releases with charged language, accusing anyone of any anything. Like that's actually just not even on his radar of how he approaches right. the work. And I think that is perhaps the, it's why, like, I think when I think of like Benghazi is a perfect example at the federal level of like, no, I mean, maybe some people did, but large groups of this country had no real interest in what was written or said by that committee, because it was clearly an unserious, politically motivated thing. And I'm not saying that's just yep. a Republican problem. I think both parties sure. um, oh, well, are, of course. are guilty of this. Um Truman is super intentional about his committee and his work. It's, it's true, right, that every report was unanimously bipartisan in the committee? 32 reports during Truman's time as chairman until he resigned in 1944. 32 reports, thousands of pages, every single one of them bipartisan and unanimous. It's one of the things that Truman himself, decades later, was most proud about. So how does how does that happen? How does he cultivate yep. that? In a, there's probably political opportunity for someone on the committee to say, "I'm not going to stand for this anti-American BS. We need to stand behind the war effort." Nobody does yep. that. What's what's the secret of, of how that? So happened? he did several he did several things. I've been talking a lot about Truman's leadership style and how he learned it on the Truman Committee. He chose his senators wisely, although he you know there were still two Republicans on there, and it's not that politics never intervene. He chose his senators wisely. He was very willing, and this I think is key, to not take the credit for everything. Eventually, mm -hmm. the, after the first report, everybody just called it the Truman Committee, but Truman was very open if, if there was a certain investigation in a certain sta senator's state or on a subject at a certain, like railroads or steel on a subject at a certain center, he would appoint it, create a subcommittee committee, let that person be the chairman, and let that person mm -hmm. deliver the report in the Senate. By being a little magnanimous, again, if you're willing to not take the credit, you can get a lot done in the world. And then let's just say it took a lot of work. Um, Truman had a little room off of his office called the Dog House. It had mm -hmm. cartoons and posters on the wall. Most importantly, it had a refrigerator and it had bottles of bourbon and scotch and such. Uh, and the senators would sit in there. When there was a draft report, they would sit in there and they would go over them page by page and each senator was allowed to say, hey, I don't like this. And if there was a disagreement, Truman would take the two senators and send them out to fix it. Or they would air their disagreements. They would kick it back down to the staff, have a rewritten. And so oftentimes hmm. there would be several drafts of the report. But Truman took great pains to listen to the senators when they had concerns to include that in the report. And then once again, I'll back up and say, by super focusing on the facts and not opinion or trying to spin this made it easier for all the senators to get on board. There was no opinions expressed. It was basically, this is the facts. The, we are not making enough airplanes to meet our quota. That's a fact. The, there is a steel shortage. That's a fact. That made it easier to build consensus on the committee. Mm -hmm. So that, and, and Truman did this 32 times. It's, it's really an amazing story. It's just like a very talented guy. Uh, and, you know, the other thing we haven't mentioned at all, which is incredibly prominent in the book, which made me love the book, was this is actually as much a book about Truman's team as it is about Harry Truman. Like yep. you, 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 do, you go through great pain to paint a picture of these people and their lives and what motivates them and the roles that they played. Um, uh and I, I think it's 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 a beautiful, beautiful part of the book. And you mentioned at the end, like you got access to personal letters and and records from you know many generations later, or at least a couple generations yep. later of uh, yep. some of these folks. So I think part of the magic, right, is Truman's got this cast of characters working behind him who are very skilled and committed to the mission as well. Very much so. And I'll I'll, I'll talk about another key factor in the committee's success. Normally in these times and still today. When you create one of these committees, then you need a chief counsel, a lawyer to run. Usually that go, that might go to somebody who just lost an election is looking for a job, or it would go to a political, you know, it'd be a political appointee, mm -hmm. or it'd be somebody who was a prominent lawyer and who would kind of do this in their spare time or, or whatever, you know, a big name lawyer. Truman called the attorney general of the United States and he said, I want the name of your best prosecutor. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
the attorney general recommended a 36 year old lawyer named Hugh Fulton, Fulton, who was working for them in New York. And that was the point. Truman took this seriously. And they met and Fulton said to Truman, is this going to be politics? Are there going to be whitewashes? And Truman said, nope, you let the, you find the facts. I'll take care of the rest. And they created this incredibly successful team. And then Fulton and Truman both, they hired a bunch of young lawyers right out of college, men and women. And uh, and and for many of them, that's how I got into the story, was reading the accounts of these young lawyers saying, this was, a you know, 22, 23 years old. They're flying around the country going undercover in steel plants and air engine factories. And they're investigating this stuff and they're on the front page and everything. For many of them, it was the most exciting job they had ever had. And every single one of them had praise for Truman saying, this is the best, yep. you know, this guy was amazing. And that's what really... 10 years ago or so got me sort of going down the road of trying to write a book about this. So we will get back to glowing about Truman and the Truman Committee. But before we do, you've <laughs> you've, you've mentioned this. Uh, this is not a no politics committee. That is not that is right. not an accurate description. So um, first of all, you've got Truman's reputation, which I think this committee pretty successfully helps him overcome. He's not the senator from yep. Pendergast by the time this is over. He is the right. the front cover of Time magazine and the the watchdog, if you will, of right. uh, the American Defense Program. But uh, there's the Chandler swimming pool, uh, which was yep. a, sel a selectively managed investigation, you write, that clears <laughs> yep. a fellow Democrat. Um, and a, and yep. frankly, it's a similar dynamic with FDR. Um, but there's also yep. like, that th that was political... He finds out about the Manhattan Project, and he yep. doesn't go forward with that. That's less political. That's probably more national security. Um, national security. But kind of taking what worked for Truman and zooming out a little bit, how should government officials conceive of the role of politics in government oversight? Right. Because if you let politics drive oversight, then you've got a Benghazi committee or some you know useless... Yep political weapon that no one cares about but if you don't right. if you're not attuned to politics uh then you are not going to be empowered or listened to or like the roosevelt administration could have easily sidelined the truman committee in a few different ways oh, totally and they didn't fully do that they probably did in a couple ways but like how do you think yep. about the role of politics in oversight right um the truman committee was political and and you could argue let's take the let's take a different point of view that um, building all this consensus, taking all this time, getting a bipartisan thing. Well, one of the potential downsides of that would be that um, that some more contentious areas or some more politically dangerous areas might be covered up. In other words, by mm -hmm. finding consensus, they may not have told the fullest truth. So they may not have gotten the information out there as fast enough. OK, that's one style of government. Truman's uh -huh. style of government was to build a consensus. Let's find the points of view that we can agree on. And in this way, his oversight role worked. Um, had he seriously criticized the Roosevelt administration or blew the whistle on the Manhattan Project, they probably would have shut him, shut him down. Had his reports been overly partisan, then Republicans would have, you know, would have ignored him or there would have been constant criticism in the press that he was kowtowing to Franklin Roosevelt or whatever. Truman, for three straight years, walked this, as I said, a very careful middle line of speaking the truth and then the main thing that he could do in a political sense was not call a public hearing and not having get in the press. Truman was perfect. If he ran across several, many times during the war, Truman ran across egregious examples of mismanagement or fraud or waste or corruption. If he could call up the, if he could call up the chief of staff of the army, George Marshall, and say, hey, fix this, and Marshall would do it, fine. No mm -hmm. one would ever know. And mm -hmm. so, again, that's pol that's that's politics pure and simple. And that happened many, many times. So politics played an important role. And again, it's it's Truman and others kind of after the war pretended that the Truman Committee somehow rose above politics. That's not really the case. Truman just played politics really, really well. Yeah. So a couple of key ideas that, um, again, were really important to me. I kind of touched on this a little bit. So Tr Truman is a veteran, right? He Did he serve in World yep. War One? He was a combat veteran in World War One. He was a he was a captain in charge of an artillery battery. They were in combat from for the last several months of the war, and he was a decorated uh, veteran. And it's it's a key to his story because it's part of yeah. where he learned, you know, a lot of the leadership uh, uh, skills that he would apply, you know, later in life. Well, it's also like I was thinking it like 
again, he's using this oversight committee as a tool to advance the war effort, to improve the war effort, to strengthen the war effort, yep. to save money, to save lives. He's not using this as a tool to undermine right. the war effort, which it very easily could have been used as a tool to do that under the wrong leadership. So part of the lesson here is one, just basically a over oversight can be used as a tool to support the thing it's overseeing, but B Truman is a really good fit for this subject matter. Yes. He's got credibility. He is clearly a patriot. He, he, he loves this country. He wants it to be successful. Only someone yep. like that can credibly right. criticize and expose failures and not be considered, you know, un-American. And I think it, yep. part of that is just a, a miracle of history that this right guy was in this right place. Yep. And that was the product. You know, I think a lot about how this is done today. And there's two things going on here when you're elected official. You have public service, the very simple fact, let's make sure the, the soldiers are getting the, the best equipment they need, the sailors have the best ships, the fighting equipment that they need, and the taxpayers' money is to be spent wisely. There's the public service element of it, and then there's the partisanship. It. Oh, let's make sure that we get reelected. Let's make sure that our president and our party remains in power. Those two things. I think we both know which way, <laughs> which one dominates today, but this was a time, and, and granted, Truman is working in a very patriotic time, but still, it doesn't mean that the Republicans didn't want to kick President Franklin Roosevelt out of the White House. But Truman and the Kings Committee were putting public service first, and I think that stood out. And once again, that had the political effects that, you know, in other words, one leads to the other. And I think that's the way it, it worked really well for Truman. Totally. So another... Uh big sort of category or a big lesson, I guess I would say, was it would be about like how the mechanics of oversight worked. And something that I think surprised me the more that I read was the oversight committee was not just about like going to the factories and walking through and, you know, hauling yep. people before the committee. They were getting thousands of letters and tips and yes. they had informants and whistleblowers um, I want to talk about George Dye. Maybe we can use George Dye as an example because he's a, a yep. prominent, he kind of starts as somewhat of a silly character and becomes this like actually, you know, very again, yep. patriotic character who's central to, you know, George Dye is probably in some ways responsible for saving a lot of people's lives. Um, very so much you, so. Can you tell us about George Dye and the role of these whistleblowers in, in Truman's yep. Oversight Committee? So, yep, early on, right at the beginning, Truman, uh, he, he, he went on the radio a couple of times very early in the committee's tenure, and he said, hey, Americans, help us out. You see something going on down at the factory, down at the shipyard? You see, you know, you have uh, some ideas for winning the war? Let us know. Harry Truman, Senate office building, you know, Washington, D.C. And Americans responded. Initially, a trickle, a few here and there. But gradually, as Truman put out some reports, the $100 million army camp report, more and more letters started to come in. Well, one of those letter writers was the guy you mentioned, George Dye. He was a 30 something, uh, he, was a, he was the manager of inspection at a steel man, a giant steel plant outside Pittsburgh. Uh, it was operated by the Carnegie Illinois Steel Company, a division of US Steel. And he was in charge of the inspections. Basically this plant didn't make steel, but they took giant thick slabs of steel and shaped it and made it uh, into plates that could go into ships or go into all kinds of different uses. Okay, so the steel slabs came from another plant. They were heated up and run down this long continuous strip mill, it's called, and they were hammered or whatever they do to steel slabs to make them think. Along the way, many tests were run. Was the steel of the right composition? Did it have the right amount of uh, carbon in it or uh, magnesium or whatever steel has in them? I'm certainly no expert. Uh, was it uh, fixed at the right temperature? Was it cooled properly? They would cut off a little piece of it and put it in a giant machine and pull it apart to see how strong it was. So that was George Dye's job. And quickly, of course, this plant, like many others in the defense uh, buildup and, and eventually in the war production effort, was under um, immense pressure where, you know, there's a steel shortage nationwide. So they're cranking the steel out as fast as they can. What George Dye saw in his factory was pressure on him and his inspectors to cut corners. If they, if the steel was almost made it to the inspection, but not quite, sometimes they would fudge the numbers. George Dye took his job and his public service seriously. And, and in early 1942, he's like, what the hell do I do about this? What, what am I going to do? And one night after, you know, a few days after one of the Truman reports came out, um, 
he sat down at his desk in Pittsburgh and he wrote a letter to uh, Harry S. Truman. And it was the first of many letters. The problem, as you alluded to, right, was they're they technical. Were they, they're, they're like unreadable. Yeah. Like they can't tell what he kind of seems like. There's a category of letter writers who are like the kind of crackpot letter writers that they're like, okay, I put yeah. this in a file. They all get a response. They all get a thank you for writing. But like we're not going to take those seriously. So it's it was hard for a non technical person receiving this letter to categorize someone like George Dye, who I'm sure everything he wrote was technically accurate, but it is like impossible to decipher right. what he's actually trying to say. Yeah. I um then I've sat in the National Archives. I've had these actual letters in my hands. There's wow. many of them are five or six pages. They're so full of jargon and stuff you can't, <laughs> they're they're impossible to understand. So basically, these letters are all pouring into room 160 in the Senate in the basement of the Senate office building. Somebody opens them up every day and they're reading them. Every single one, by the way, got a response. That was a rule that Truman set early on. Everyone got a response. And they're reading these letters, and I, I'm reading this letter. I'm like, I had no idea what this guy was talking, talking about. about. You know, <laughs> equations and all this stuff in there. And so they, you know, they sent him a polite two sentence brush off. Thank you very much. We'll take a look at this, and and they tossed it in. As you said, the crackpot file. And more and more, he didn't give up. He actually came to Washington that summer of 1942. He met with Hugh Fulton, uh, the chief counsel of the Truman Committee. Fulton actually listened to him. I mean, they were so busy. It's amazing that they took time to meet with this guy. And and Steve, we should mention before you keep going, Dai's job might be on the line here. Like he is putting himself yeah. at tremendous personal risk by engaging in this behavior. He is a little bit paranoid that people are going to find out. He's written this letter. He's like, please don't share yep. this. Like this was a brave thing yep. for him to do. Yeah, many of these people today, I don't think the term existed. Maybe it did, but today they're called whistleblowers, you know, uh -huh. and there's a federal law to protect them. At this time, if George Bo if George Dye's boss knew about this, they would have fired him, and nobody would have thought this anything about it. He would have been out mm -hmm. of you know. So yeah, many of these folks were putting their jobs on the line to reach out to Truman and say, "Hey, something's going on." The big challenge is thousands of these letters poured in was to sort out the real ones from the fake ones, and so George Dye's letters for not quite but almost a year went ignored. Um, which is bringing us back around to where we began the story here, Ben, which is that ship that broke up yep. in in Portland uh, in January 1943. So so what happens? So eventually yep. they, these letters, uh, something happens and there's a big field yep. trip, you could say. Uh, can you yeah. do that? I, that yeah. was one of the climaxes of the story where you're like, oh, my gosh, yep. I can't believe this is happening. So <laughs> it's funny. Um, Henry Kaiser, who built that shipyard in Portland, is almost forgotten today. We only know him for one thing, which was the healthcare system he invented, Kaiser, Kaiser Permanente. Permanente, right, right. right. But at this time, he, that guy, this guy was one of the three or four people on the home front who helped the United States win the war. He built these shipyards. Before World War II, to build one of these tanker ships or a merchant ship, it took uh, something like eight months. This, the numbers are in my book, but it took months. By the middle of the war, they had it down to less than a month. And in one spectacular case, they built one. They they laid the keel and launched the ship into the water. It wasn't done yet. Five days. So right. this is a, this is a miracle. And again, it's it's not just a, a stunt. This is crucial to winning the war because we desperately needed these ships to get the material over to Great Britain. So in March 1943, after a year's worth of George Dye writing these letters, the Truman Committee was looking at efficiency. Um, there's problems of absenteeism. How can we get more production? There's still mm -hmm. production lags. The United States, despite this uh, amazing stuff going on, was still not at the wartime production capacity that everyone knew it could and would be. So the committee was holding hearings. They called a bunch of experts. They invited Henry Kaiser to come in and testify. How are you getting these ships? How can you build a ship so fast? What? How do you keep absenteeism down? He, one of his things he said was, Many of my employees have never been to a doctor in their lives. Now they can go to a doctor, they can get treated. It doesn't cost them, you know, they get time off for work, all these things like um, his whole thing was comp competition. They would be building two ships and they would put daily big signs to say which one was going faster every day. So he was building this team, to, all this stuff. True, Kaiser testified for most of the morning that day. And then finally, one of the senators, not Truman, one of the senators says to him, well, Mr. Kaiser, the, you know, this is all great, but what about that ship that broke up a couple of months ago in Portland, uh, the, the SS Schenectady? What about that? Kaiser did not want to answer the question. <laughs> are, are you, you want me to answer that? Yeah, 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 we want to hear the answer. Are you sure? Yes. And finally, 
He says, well, the report that I have is that it was caused by bad steel, bad steel from the Carnegie Illinois Steel Company. Well, everybody responded to that, except all the young staffers on the Truman Committee who were like head smacking saying, oh my gosh, we have a stack of letters back letters. in the office from a guy saying that plant is shipping bad steel all the time. Couple of caveats, it ended up not being steel from that factory, but they were cheating, you know, they were cheating on the inspections at all the factories. It's yeah. still unclear what made those ships. Several of them, by the way, it wasn't just one. Several of them broke up. There's still a debate over what was the cause of it. But clearly, every single day, steel was going out of that factory and into ships that did not meet the specifications. So, yeah, Truman said some of his young staffers, three of them, went up there the next day. They got on a plane to Pittsburgh. They sat down in the kitchen of George Dye's home. It's like he this a, feels like this needs to be in a movie. They're like, like they go to George totally. Dye's home. They're like, it is, it is they're playing. He's like drawing a map by hand about like where <laughs> yep. the records are in the factory, yep. and like they're anticipating what actually happens, which is a little bit. I don't know if yep. they were truly dishonest, but they clearly like they go. What was the? Yep. They go under the under the a different guys. They, like they're like they call up the steel plant and they say, Hey, we, you know, we hear you're setting all these production records. Can we come by and take a look? Wow. <laughs> your steel plant's doing a great job. Can we get a tour? Uh, sure. The president of the steel company arranges a tour. They're touring through the steel plant and, and it is very impressive. This company and others were doing amazing things, but as they go through the steel plant, well, interestingly, how do you inspect all these, um, <laughs> how do you inspect all these steel slabs? What do you, how do you keep all the records? That's really interesting. Oh, and by the way, didn't one of these ships break up? And can we take a look at the inspection records? Now the steel officials at this company. I'm going to lose my earbud, so I'm just going to uh, switch over here. Is this okay? Oh, yeah, that's totally fine. So they're touring through the steel plant. Um, they're getting all this information, uh, but they're starting to ask more pointed questions. How do you inspect the steel? What about that ship that broke up a couple of months ago? Can we look at the inspection book? The steel company officials... What inspection book? We don't have any inspection book. And they know because they had a map and George, I told them the inspection book was 10 feet away, right? And <laughs> so they're asking, they're finding like, well, yeah, it turns out we do have an inspection book, but it's too complicated. You wouldn't uh, possibly understand it. Well, we'd like to see it anyway. There's a lot of back and forth. Finally, they give them the records and then you know, should I tell the story? Should I keep Please going? Please do. No. Yeah, the, the the letter F next to yeah. that. <laughs> this is the best part. And it's like you say, when I when I write it, it's like, I know I have a good story to tell here. It's like a movie. Yeah. They get into the room and they get the inspection records. And uh, the assistant chief counsel of the committee is a guy named Rudolph Halley. He's talking to these people. They have the woman who keeps the books, her boss, and all these other officials. Uh, I noticed that some of these uh, entries, the inspection records, some of them are written in pencil. What's that about? Well, yeah, sometimes we don't have the actual thing. And so we have to, you know, we have to go back and do it in, in pencil. Well, some of these pencil ones have a capital F written right next to them. <laughs> Rudolph Halley looks at the young secretary sitting there, a woman named Irene Pasternak. What's going on with the F? She She's looks like, uh... at him. Yeah, she has the classic deer in the headlights <laughs> thing. And she sits there for a bit. She looks up at her boss and he says, oh, F means phone. <laughs> that means we have to call up on the phone and get the information. Well, everyone knew at the time that F didn't, that the word phone does not <laughs> F. And they knew what the F mean because George and I had told them. So they take the secretary into a private room. They give her a sheet of paper, U.S. United States Senate paper. And they say, come on, tell us the truth. What's going on here? And she tells them F means faith. Mm -hmm. Three days later, every front page uh, headline in the country, fake steel coming out of a Pittsburgh steel plant, fake steel that might be going into ships that are sinking, you know, warships, everything. People are outraged all across the country. It's a giant media uh, storm. Um, it once again puts Truman on the front page. Mm -hmm. uh, there are hearings, investigations that would go out for months and months and months. And of course, as we would have today, there's a corporate pushback too. So uh, I love that story. I think it's I think it's a beautiful illustration of the power of the committee. If we have, I think we've got time to do one additional kind of like case study from the sure. book. Can we talk about uh, General Somerville and oh, yeah. that uh, that saga? Tell us tell us what was going yeah. on there. We should say too. This is actually one of the Truman Committee's failures in in a mm -hmm. certain sense. Mm -hmm. So um, early in the war, um, 
a big priority was Alaska. Uh, Alaska was a strategic site. It was kind of a staging area to get to Japan. It was concerns that Japan might invade Alaska. They were all, and, and eventually the Japanese did invade and seize two of the Aleutian Islands. So mm -hmm. lots of strategic concern over Alaska. One of the questions, how do we get fuel and gasoline up there? A um, lot of back and forth. We could take it by ships, but somehow there's a, frankly, a crazy idea to build a pipeline from a refine a, a, a oil site in a, in Canada to build a pipeline hundreds of miles to another remote site that would refine this oil and somehow get it to Alaska. It ends up becoming Canadian oil, or it ends up the short term is can oil. There's yeah. a general, a brilliant general in the army named Brahan Somerville. He's the guy who built the Pentagon. He could get things done. Boy, could he ever! But he did not like uh, he did not like Harry Truman for one thing. He did not like people to push back on him. He thought uh, everybody was wasting his time, and he was on his way to win the war. And so somehow, General Somerville signed off on this project, and twenty five million dollars ended up in the Pentagon budget with no study, no environmental study, no study of can this be done, no estimates of how long it's going to take. I mean, literally a one page memo. He looked at this and said, yeah, do it. Well, and, uh, and Truman, Truman's perception of him, right. is like, this is a guy who just does not care about money. He's like, yep. spend them. I don't care about money. I'm winning the war. That is my job. You figure out the money. We're yep. just spending, spending, spending. Yep. Truman said this, you know, no military man knows a thing about money. All they want to do is spend it. You know, that was his, yeah. his summary. And Somerville didn't disagree. There's a war on, we got to win the war. Well, okay. <laughs> but in this case, it would it would waste the taxpayers two hundred and fifty million dollars, which could be spent in other ways to advance the war effort. Building fighter planes, building bombers, right. making new rifles. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not it's it's not so simple to say oh there's a war on. You know we don't we yeah. don't have time for this stuff. This oversight and this scrutiny is in, 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 terribly important. And this story, better than any other in the book, tells that story. So they're going along, and it just starts off at twenty five million, and then next thing you know, it's one hundred and twenty million has been spent on this pipeline. It's nowhere near finished. It's way over its deadline and it's way over its budget. And sure enough, Truman says a team up there and they come back and say, this is pointless. Um, they hold hearings. By this time, it's kind of a done deal. Uh, I mean, Truman had been fighting it all along and the military, as they do, doubled down. Oh, mm -hmm. it's one, they, they pulled the old national security thing on him too. Oh, this is top secret national security. Sorry, we can't talk about that. Somerville got the chief of staff of the army and then the, and then who got Roosevelt to sign off on it. And so basically Truman was stonewalled. What does he do? Let's subpoena everybody. Let's have some hearings. It's kind of a done deal. And we've seen this over the decades, time and time again, this desire for public oversight to keep an eye on what the government's doing versus this national security thing. And oftentimes as with the Manhattan Project, it was a valid concern. They didn't want this all over the papers. Yep. In yep. this case, the military used it as a shield to hide behind. And you know, every single study during and after the war, this thing was a giant waste. It was never going to happen. It ended up costing, like I said, $250 million. They sold it off for scrap for like a million bucks after the war. The whole thing was a giant waste. And you could have, you could, you could have shipped more fuel more cheaply just using ships up and down the coast. <laughs> the Navy raised their hand and said, we'll happily do it for like a fraction of that cost. Yeah. We can do it much faster. We could do it right now. Like the whole thing was just a boondoggle. So we're gonna we're gonna force one more in uh, as a case study because I don't want to end on a bad note. And let's so let's yeah. talk about the uh, the tank lighters. Oh yeah, uh, because this is a this is a case study where the committee um, actually does win, and ultimately yep. I think this is a great example of saving saving lives. Saving lives. Yeah, yeah, sure. So we've all seen the movies. Uh, Tom Hanks or somebody else. It's D Day. We're off the shore of Normandy, and those and they have and and one of the big challenges of World War II. How do we move tens of thousands of men hundreds of miles across the ocean or across the English Channel in this case? And then how do we get them ashore on a beach? We can't just go into the port and drop them off at the port. That won't work because, you know, that. so this question of landing craft was a huge one. People all over the world were trying to racing to develop some kind of boat that would get the people ashore. The Navy had designed a boat that it thought was uh, perfectly fine. But there was a boat builder in New York, New Orleans, a very uh, colorful figure named Andrew Jackson Higgins. Mm -hmm. He had designed a much better boat. Uh, they ended up being called Higgins boats. And Dwight Eisenhower would eventually say that the Higgins boats played a giant role in making the D-Day landings a success and countless of landings in the Pacifics. These boats were, he had just designed a perfect sort of shallow boat, had the ramp that came down. 
And then there were bigger ones too. One that, you know, there, some carried infantry troops, some carried uh, heavy equipment like tanks. And these, the, the Navy, again, for these tank, tank lighters, they were called, the mm -hmm. Navy had its own design. And they favored the design. Higgins was like, that one sucks. Um, it's underpowered. It's dangerous. It won't work. I've got a much better one. He built a prototype in three days and he showed it off to the Army and Navy. And the Navy, for whatever reason, totally blew him off. They didn't like mm -hmm. this guy. He was, uh, and they had their own design. They kind of closed ranks around them. Higgins went to Washington and he knocked on Truman's door in the Senate. Help me out here. Truman had a pretty good idea. Let's take this guy's boat, he told the Navy, and your boat, and let's put a tank on them, and let's see how they do in choppy waters. Let's test it. Makes sense. So they tested it out. They Down off Norfolk, Virginia, they put a tank on each of these two boats. They sailed a few miles. Higgins's boat went, to, went ashore, dropped its tank on the shore, and then came back to circle around the navy design boat, which was nearly floundering in the heavy seas, and completely failed to complete the mission. Finally, the Navy wakes up and says, okay, you know, your boat's better. They order hundreds of them. And then literally the rest is history. So this is a concrete example of the Truman Committee stepping in, pushing the Navy hard, going public when they needed to, to say, listen, you, th this is endangering people's lives. And it's a concrete case in which the Truman Committee had an outcome on, you know, on saving lives and helping to win the war. So I love that story. I love that example. Um, this is this is how I want to end it. I, I want to make I'm going to make four claims right. that I think are true based on reading your book. I think you make these claims yourself in the book. Probably. Just to underscore for listeners, like I think government oversight sounds like a wonky sort of like, you know, boring or like, you know, you just imagine it. It, it doesn't sound sexy or exciting, but th th these are four claims I want to make about government oversight uh, okay. using the Truman Committee as an example. One. The Truman Committee saved the United States billions of dollars. Yes. Two, the Truman Committee saved countless lives. We can't put a number on that, but we know for sure the Truman Committee, through government oversight, saved people's lives. Three, the Truman Committee ultimately played a significant role in the United States winning World War II. And four, Harry Truman would never have become president of the United States without the Truman Committee. Yep. I Are would those say right? Yeah, I would say four for four. I would qualify number three a little bit. Yes, they did okay. play. A, they did play a significant role in winning the war. But I, I actually kind of want to, even in the book, I tried to say, listen, all these production miracles, the United States and the production miracles of Henry Kaiser and Henry Ford and General Motors and and thousands of businessmen and millions of workers, the Rosie the Riveter story. That's an amazing story. And it it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's a it's a huge factor in the United States winning the war. The Truman Committee wasn't that, but what they did was keep an eye on that and try and keep it on the straight and narrow, try and identify problems and fix them. So I'm I'm gonna give a qualified yes to that one. I think, you know, I think there's a tendency to confuse this oversight effort with the effort itself. Of and so those are two yeah. distinct things. But that one. But all the other ones, and including that one, I agree. I think, you know, and the subtitle in my book is Help Win World War II. I think yeah. they did. The other ones, there's no question that without the Truman Committee, Truman would never have been vice president. Even as late as 1944, he was already a national figure. He's on the cover of Time. He still was like number four on the list. And so, <laughs> you know, his name was kind of gradually rising. So that one, um, countless lives. We'll never know how many ships would have sank because the steel was bad in them. How many airplane engines that were coming out of a factory in Dayton might have been shipped with bad parts or rusty parts if Truman hadn't stepped in to investigate? How many how many soldiers and sailors might have drowned on those terrible inferior army tank lighters? There's one Marine general said the only thing those things would have done was got us killed. Like that's from mm -hmm. a general who had you know no dog in the fight. Mm -hmm. um, they saved lives, and there's no question. Everybody who studied the Truman Committee agrees that it saved billions of dollars. Truman liked to say $15 billion. No one knows where he got that idea. And you really can't, you, you, it, it's really impossible to put, a, put an actual dollar figure on them, but there's no question that both in the things that became public, but how many times did they make a phone call and something got fixed or something got stopped because of fear of the Truman Committee? That was a real fear during the war. Mm -hmm. And so there's no question they saved billions of dollars. Well, Steve, I just want to say thank you again for coming on the podcast. The book is called The Watchdog. I cannot recommend it enough. And I really do think, you know, you you mentioned this, uh, I think it might be in the epilogue or something, but um, 
you, I mean, my perception, you've added something very important to the historical record that was not previously deeply Thank explored. Um, and I think it's just incredibly useful, not just for understanding um, the World War II era and Harry Truman as a person, but like it is a really powerful case study for people who want government oversight to be effective and to work. Um, so I just want to say thank you for writing the book. It's a it's a very valuable contribution, and I'm really gl glad that I got to read it. Well, great. I, it's it's great to hear the, those compliments, and it's been a great pleasure talking with you. I've really enjoyed it. Awesome, uh, everybody. Thank you so much for listening, Steve. Thanks for coming on the podcast, and we'll see you back here next week. <laughs>